Hey everyone, welcome to the video on nuclear fission. Nuclear fission is a type of nuclear transmutation. And by way of review, transmutation are processes that produce a new element by changing the number of protons in the nucleus. The other types of transmutations include alpha decay, beta plus decay, beta minus decay, as well as nuclear fusion. I talk about these types of decay in other videos. Nuclear fusion is specifically the type of decay process through which a large element will split apart to form smaller elements. Nuclear fusion can be spontaneous or artificial. Spontaneous or natural fission is when the nucleus splits on its own, whereas artificial fission is involving some kind of intervention. Nuclear fission occurs when an unstable nucleide splits apart to form smaller daughter nucleides. In natural nuclear fusion, an unstable parent nucleus, such as uranium-236, splits to produce two nucleides that are smaller in size. In addition to these nucleides, neutrons can sometimes be also produced. You should remember that the neutron to proton ratio, as well as the number of protons of the nucleus, are major determinants of a nucleide's stability. Natural nuclear fission usually occurs for very large nuclei, that is, those with a large number of protons. In contrast, in artificial nuclear fission, a nuclei is made more unstable by colliding it with a very high velocity particle, such as a neutron. The nuclear stability changes in this collision because the addition of a new particle, such as a neutron, will alter the nuclear composition of this nuclei. In this example, the neutron that's being fired at the uranium-235 nucleus temporarily forms uranium-236, which subsequently undergoes nuclear fission to form the daughter nuclei and the neutrons that we saw earlier. While the two processes may seem very similar, radioactive decay and nuclear fission are actually not the same process. They are often confused together because they are both classified as nuclear transmutation. The two processes also produce nucleides that are more stable and have higher binding energies as well. Lastly, both processes can be induced, that is, they can be both classified as artificial transmutation. However, there are numerous differences between normal decay and nuclear fission. In radioactive decay, the products are more so predictable. For example, alpha decay produces alpha particles and beta decay produces beta particles. In addition, Radioactive decay emits smaller nucleides and particles than nuclear fission and are more often spontaneous rather than artificial. In contrast, the products produced by nuclear fission are unpredictable. This is the major difference between decay and nuclear fission. Even though the diagram shows the production of krypton and barium as the daughter nucleides of nuclear fission of uranium, there could be other combinations of nuclei being formed from the fission of uranium-236. No matter what the products are, they need to obey the conservation of mass and energy. So as long as the number of neutrons and protons before and after the reaction remain conserved, then any combination of daughter nuclei could be possibly formed from nuclear fission. So unlike decay, it is very difficult for us to predict exactly what type of daughter nuclei can be produced from the splitting of a large nucleus. Furthermore, in nuclear fission, the size of the nuclei produced are usually much larger than decay. And as I mentioned earlier, in addition to the daughter nucleides, neutrons can also be produced. All types of nuclear transmutation involve energy changes. Energy can either be absorbed or released during transmutation, depending on a few factors. The mass of reactants and products of a nuclear transmutation can be used to compare and determine whether this energy is absorbed or released. When the mass of the products is less than the mass of the reactants, the transmutation releases energy and it's described as exothermic. This is because the mass difference between the reactant and the product has been converted into energy through the energy and mass equivalence principle, otherwise known as E equals mc squared. Conversely, when the mass of the products is greater than the mass of the reactants, energy is instead absorbed during the transmutation process, and the term for this is endothermic. For any type of transmutation processes, whether it's radioactive decay, nuclear fusion or nuclear fission, the binding energies of reactants and products will be always different 
When the binding energy of the products is greater than the reactants, the transmutation is exothermic, so this means it releases energy. In this example, the total binding energies of the reactant is 0.1 MeV, while the binding energy of the newly formed nucleus from the fusion is 0.2 MeV. 0.1 MeV of binding energy in the reactant means we need to put in this amount of energy to break apart the nucleons before we can form the product. When the particles are broken, they can then form the product, and this releases the binding energy of the product, which is 0.2 MeV. As you can see, overall, we have more energy being released from the reaction than what was originally going into the reaction in the first place. This results in a 0.1 MBV amount of energy being released from the reaction, and hence why the reaction is described as exothermic. Let's look at what happens when the binding energy of the product is less than the binding energies of the reactants. In this example, 0.2 MeV of energy needs to be absorbed to break apart the nucleons in these two nucleides. And when the product nucleus is being formed, its binding energy, 0.1 MeV, will be released. This time, we have more energy going into the reaction than what is released at the very end. This results in a net energy of 0.1 MeV being absorbed by the nuclear transmutation process. This is why when the binding energy of the product is less than the binding energies of the reactants combined, the reaction will absorb energy overall and is described as endothermic. Let's look at how energy changes are involved in nuclear fusion and nuclear fission. A great example of nuclear fusion is the production of energy in stars. For example, the proton-proton chain, PPC, and the carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen cycle, or the CNO cycle for short. Again, I talk more about these two processes in another video. What you need to know here is that the products of nuclear fusion in stars have greater binding energy than the reactants. This means nuclear fusion reactions in stars will release energy and allow the star to produce energy and survive. Spontaneous fusion reactions are quite similar. The products also have greater binding energy than the reactants do. This also means the products of fission reaction are more stable than the reactants, which is consistent with the main goal of nuclear fusion, which is to achieve greater nuclear stability. Since the products of fission has higher bunny energy, fission is also an exothermic nuclear transmutation process. Going back to this graph of bunny energy of different nucleides, what this also shows is that spontaneous fusion only occurs for elements smaller than iron because the products will have higher binding energy than the reactants do. Conversely, on the right hand side of the graph, nucleides larger than iron would undergo spontaneous nuclear fission to produce smaller nucleides. And the smaller nucleides that's being produced will also have higher binding energies than the reactants at the very beginning. As we saw earlier, nuclear fission can produce high speed neutrons in addition to daughter nucleides. We also discussed how a neutron alone can be used to induce nuclear fission in a process called artificial transmutation. Now, if we take these emitted neutrons and fire them at more nucleides that can undergo fission, like uranium, we can generate even more nuclear fission reactions. This idea of generating further fission from using the products, that is the neutrons, of one fission reaction is called a chain reaction. There are several types of chain reactions. A critical chain reaction is one where the fission reaction can only induce one further fission reaction. This will allow for a constant rate of fission where the number of reactions will not increase nor decrease. The amount of fissionable material that's required to achieve this critical chain reaction is called the critical mass. If the amount of fissionable material is less than the critical mass, then you will not have a chain reaction. Now, what happens if we have more than the critical mass? You can imagine the number of neutrons produced will increase the more fission reactions there will be. And as each neutron causes new fission reactions, the number of fission reactions will also increase because each neutron can theoretically induce one further fission reaction by colliding with another fissionable nucleus, such as uranium in this diagram. Over time, the total amount of energy produced on fission will increase exponentially and out of control. This is known as an uncontrolled chain reaction. Now, what I want to focus on in this video is actually a controlled chain reaction. 
This is when each fission reaction can induce further fissions, but in a way such that the rate of fission and the energy produced is in a controlled manner. In a control chain reaction, the rate of fission can be changed accordingly to the energy demand and the need. And this is relatively safe compared to uncontrolled chain reactions. The precise control in a control chain reaction is allowed by absorbing some of the neutrons that's being emitted by the nuclear fission reaction. When these neutrons here are absorbed, they cannot induce another fission reaction. Therefore, if we can carefully control how many neutrons are absorbed and how many are not absorbed, we can then control the number and the rate of nuclear fission in a chain reaction. We use control rods to absorb and capture neutrons that we don't want inducing fission reactions. When these control rods, that is the neutron absorber, are placed between fissionable nucleides, some of the emitted neutrons can then be absorbed. This reduces the number of nuclear fission reactions and the total amount of energy produced by the whole reaction. Control rods are commonly made of cadmium or boron, as these materials are great for absorbing neutrons. Neutrons emitted from fission travel at very high speeds and have very large kinetic energy. This is actually now a favorable thing in the nuclear fission context, as high-speed neutrons will knock the nucleons out of the nucleus instead of inducing a nuclear fission reaction. This is where moderators become very important. Moderators are materials that will slow down neutrons that are emitted from a fission reaction. They still allow the neutrons to pass through themselves, but with a much lower kinetic energy. This is done so that when they collide with a fissionable nuclide, it will increase the likelihood of fission and therefore the rate of fission. We usually use heavy water and graphite as materials for moderators. Heavy water is where the normal hydrogen-1 isotope are substituted by hydrogen-2 isotopes. Hydrogen-2 isotopes is also known as deuterium. So the formula for heavy water is D2O instead of H2O. On the other hand, graphite is a material made from just carbon atoms. Both substances are able to slow down neutrons and increase the efficiency of the nuclear fission. One of the reasons why understanding control chain reactions is important is that they are used in nuclear reactors. In the main part of the nuclear power plant, we use controlled chain reactions to produce energy from nuclear fission in an efficient and sustainable manner. This is of course only made possible through the use of control rods and moderators. Control rods absorb neutrons and reduce the reaction rates, while moderators will slow down neutrons emitted from nuclear fissions and increase the efficiency of the overall reactions. The energy produced from fission is in the form of heat, and this is absorbed by the cool water that is pumped into the nuclear reaction chamber when the water absorbs the heat produced from fission, it is turned into steam. Now, the steam is then used to power a turbine, and the turbine in turn powers generators. In Module 6, we talk about generators, which are devices that will convert mechanical energy into electricity. An important aspect to note is that the steam, once it's being used to power the turbine, it is then cooled and condensed back down into liquid water. The water is reused by pumping it into the nuclear reactor once it's been cooled. It's important to understand that the water used in a nuclear power plant cannot be discarded as they are not only thermally polluted, but also contaminated with a great amount of radiation. This concludes the video on nuclear fission.